there's a huge institutional disconnect and challenge because government hasn't been set up oriented to listen, adapt, and support entrepreneurs. And the speed at which government operates is very different than the speed at which entrepreneurs operate. This is not a small challenge. One thing that is happening, noticing entrepreneurial communities. And this is an emerging policy agenda around innovation clusters. It's not at all settled how to understand them, how to support them. One concept that I laid here was there's a lot to learn from Boulder. Now, there are some ways that the government does support entrepreneurs that are worth appreciating. One is government has a lot of data that it can liberate to allow entrepreneurs to create companies around that help consumers and create economic growth. One such data set was 401k plans, where there's a report done to the Department of Labor by all companies as to what administrative fees their employees pay. It turns out these can be extraordinary. And in order to bring them down, this company Brightscope gives people insight into how their fee compares with others, enables people to save money. I'm pretty sure the business model is it's free, and they try to take a cut of how much money you save, and they've been really successful. <coughs> this company took off after Obama took office because of the open government commitment, where the review is now, if you can liberate data in machine readable form, do it. Before, these reports were only available in paper form, and Brightscope had to scan them very carefully and try to migrate <coughs> into a usable data set. Those days are over. It's now available electronically to anyone who asks. President Obama um, here visiting in Silicon Valley. This is after the State of the Union, looking for ways in which the government can help to support innovation and promote private sector job growth. As I said earlier, this is a problem easier to um, describe than take it on. One way that government plays a crucial role is infrastructure. Spectrum is what you might call our invisible infrastructure. We have a legacy problem in the United States. A lot of businesses and governments who have their um, customer relationship management systems or employee uh, benefits software that goes back to the 1960s have legacy problems because sometimes they still have systems that were built on COBOL and they have to keep some people around to understand how to use it. Now, the government's legacy problem is it allocated spectrum when it thought the best use of spectrum was over the air broadcast TV. We have 300 megahertz of spectrum allocated to over the air broadcast TV in this country. That's more than any other country in the world. We made the decision to double down on over the air, in fact, probably triple down on over the air broadcast spectrum to support UHF stations. Those are the ones that were on the other part of the dial for those of you who are my age and older. You know, people that will be meeting this concept, but just make channels 14 to uh, 50. Those are UHF, and most communities don't have a lot of UHF programming. And those that do, a lot of it actually is because if you are a UHF TV station, you get a must-carry right to be carried on your cable system or on satellite systems, and 9% of the US gets their TV through those connections. Meanwhile, wired and wireless broadband is an emerging infrastructure. Here's a map showing where it is in the US where it's not. <coughs> One challenge that I had written about in the paper was how do we transition from spectrum given to over-the-air broadcasters to wireless broadband? Interesting backstory, I wrote that paper for Jason Furman, who is then director of the Hamilton Project. Jason went on to be the deputy director to Larry Summers at the National Economic Council, and he called me up when I was at the Justice Department to talk about spectrum. I you know, gave him some ideas, and the next call I got to Phil is, we could use you to help make this initiative real, and so, after consulting with a number of people, I said, I gotta do this. And like I said, it's a great experience. This is where we are, according to Cisco, global IP traffic. And what is interesting and worth noting is the Wi-Fi IP traffic. That is spectrum that is unlicensed. So one of the great experiments and interesting case studies was in 1985, Mike Marcus, an engineer at the FCC said, there's this band of spectrum used for heavy machinery. It's so-called junk spectrum. What if we let people use low-powered applications? And 
not regulated. And they had the RG regulatory chairman at the time and it appealed to him. So he said, sure, let's allow that unlicensed use of the spectrum. Years later, the technology for Wi-Fi was developed. That was a test bed band. And it has become a revolutionary technology that it's fair to say saved AT&T's bacon with the iPhone. And AT&T went from viewing unlicensed spectrum with great suspicion to great support because about half of the total traffic on AT&T's wireless networks, think iPhone users, is on Wi-Fi networks. And if you wonder why your iPhones are so darn aggressive about asking you every moment in time to go onto any Wi-Fi network around, it's to get around the bandwidth challenge that the cellular networks have a larger area. They are less efficient in terms of the spectrum reuse, a con concept that Dale Hathaway will be happy to walk you all through later if you want. And so it is a valuable part of our wireless <coughs> system. And so the challenge is making more spectrum available, both for that mobile IP traffic, that's a small graph, as well as for the Wi-Fi traffic. Now, I came to the National Economic Council, and Larry Summers was talking to me about this and, and tried to understand, can this be right, that if we free up spectrum from the broadcasters by giving the broadcasters money to essentially give up their spectrum rights, the government can take a cut of that money and users are better off because they have less uh, congestion on these networks. That sounded like a win-win-win. The broadcasters are better off. The government's better off against revenue. And consumers are better off. And the economy is better off too. There's job growth associated with it. That is a, you know, yeah, the economy is four, four times over a win. And he got this would not be an easy initiative to pull off, but it was important to do. And here's Larry's kind of mantra about public action and private investment. Again, it's a type of public action that catalyzes private investment with the government playing this coordination role. Now, for those who don't fully understand or believe me in the following point, you can talk to Dale Hatfield afterwards. And I had some people in Washington say, why couldn't we just let the broadcasters, you know, lease out their spectrum to wireless broadband providers? Broadcasters think high-powered transmissions, <coughs> cellular networks are more compressed, lower powered. Dale taught me you can't put low powered right next to high powered. That's like oil and water because you get challenging interference problems. You really need to zone the spectrum so that you can have the like uses next to each other. It's much more efficient that way. And that's the role of government here. So Larry Summers lays out this idea of the spectrum <laughs> issue. And six months later, after the State of the Union, the president puts a little bit more meat on those bones about how the initiative will take root. He does it going to Marquette, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula, where he opens the speech by saying, we're not just here because it's beautiful. And by the way, for those who've never been to the Upper Peninsula, it is beautiful. <laughs> and people are nice, and people, by the way, actually are really nice. Um, it's because the uh, Northern Michigan University set up a, call it advanced Wi-Fi, Wi-matched network, to Hunter Marks with a lot of effort to that, that gives the students at Northern Michigan University access to distance learning over these networks. It's a, if you will, demonstration of what can happen with wireless broadband. Um, I got to go on this trip, again with the niche, and there's Jason Furman and Austin Goolsby, the chair of the Econ um, Council of Economic Advisors. I will say, I've actually never traveled business class before. But Air Force One, for having seen business class, is much better. And, <laughs> I did get to take home some souvenirs for my kids. Um, it was a experience of a lifetime at Michigan University. And the president, right before then, got a little demonstration of the distance learning. And here's the wireless uh, innovation initiative about these voluntary inspection, uh, spectrum auctions. Freeing up spectrum is also being used by the government, making that more efficient. Investing money to spur the rollout of 4G spectrum nationwide, building a network for public safety, so the public safety can have also advanced uses of wireless connectivity. Historically, public safety has lived, if you will, around 1990s technology. Uh, the iPhones that we all use, as a New York police chief, Raymond Kelly said, are much more advanced than what public safety generally has. And then finally, innovation of R&D for seed corn for future investments. So finally, I want to sum up on innovation national priorities. Government 2.0, the open data is more generally involved with open innovation. 
Government does not have all the answers. There are lots of developers. If you liberate data in issues like energy, transportation, government solutions can take that data and develop it in interesting ways. It's one of the things the administration has done, to my mind, exceptionally well. One other important challenge that we as a nation have to start with is how we use energy. Uh, I think there is huge opportunities by giving consumers more information about their energy usage. One of the tech stars companies this summer, Simple Energy, is focused on a part of this. We as a nation have a challenge because the infrastructure is built up by regular utilities whose economic incentive has not generally been to save energy. They get paid more when they sell more. So turning that around is a regulatory challenge. The technology to use energy more efficiently, sometimes we come to having smart grid, is still emerging. One of the great leaders in that, Tim, I don't know if Tim's here tonight. Tim's here back here, another great entrepreneur in our community. Kendall is a nationwide leader in getting the technology to be able to smart grid framework. So they had they a blast, and uh, it really was an experience of a lifetime. So uh, now's the fun part where Brad gets to follow up and.